We'll be looking at cost of governance and quite a number of developments um, in this regards have taken place, uh, starting with the president uh, in his recent address, cutting down um, his entourage, whether on a local or international trip, uh, by 60%. We know how much the conversation around the cost of governance has persisted in Nigeria, uh, which spent over 75% of our federal budget on recurrent expenditure, uh, leaving less than 25% on capital expenditure. A good part of that spending is on administrative capital, and the recurrent expenditure is over 85% personnel expense, and these are largely for the maintenance of less than 1% of our entire population. We constitute mainly people in the civil and public service. Uh, but it has been the dream of this country to raise uh, or to make fundings available of up to 40% um, in areas that will have greater impact on a larger percentage of its citizenry. And finding that, that fund, you know, has become empirical, especially at a time where we are not making so much money uh, from the sales of oil and we are not doing very much uh, with uh, non-oil experts. And to help us in drilling down um, into these conversations and providing perspective on uh, how else or how best uh, we can achieve this whole drive to cut the cost of governance. It's uh, one who many of us are very accustomed to. He's a playwright, he's a human rights activist. Uh, he's the president of the Civil Rights Congress of Nigeria and the chairman of Hand in Hand Africa. Uh, join me in welcoming to the studio, Senator Sheo Sani. Uh, should I say comrade? Good morning, sir. <laughs> Thank you for having me in your program. So which, which is your preferred uh, 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 preface? Comrade is better. Oh, okay. Okay, okay What's comrade. a comrade they I say? I don't forget a one-time aspirant of a uh, governorship aspirant of Kaduna. Yes, um, and he has been actually very vocal, uh, if you follow his handle on social media, exactly. on developments around the polity. Uh, so sometimes uh, if you go into a very long deep and you wake up and you want to catch up on Nigeria, <laughs> it's good you just um, you take a quick dive into it what did. happens in his hand. Thank you exactly. for that. Exactly. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome. And I dare to say that you have continued to look young. You probably would share details with us later <laughs> on, on what the secret has been, I, considering I, the hash economic. Should it be uh, after the interview? Or no, maybe that would be before. after the interview. Oh, maybe oh. not for the public. Uh, uh, once we get it, I, I others... I was thinking the same thing. Yes. <laughs> Welcome, Senator. Welcome, Senator. Thank you for having me. So we, we got that um, announcement from the President, which you also commended. Um, and in your intervention, you talked about how the state should also take a cue uh, from that. But we have seen a lot of Nigeria express um, pessimism about the commitment of the president to actually uh, leave the spirit of that, that, that announcement with regards to what Nigerian, young Nigerians will say, we will wait for your next foreign trip to see how committed you are to this. Uh, but what was your first impression you know, when, when that announcement was made? And how do you think we can vitalize it? Because there is clearly a huge gap between policy pronouncement and actual executions in Nigeria. Well, um, for a very long time, uh, at least since the return of democracy in 1999, there has been an outcry from the public as regards to how public funds have been wasted by people in the position of authority. And um, this criticism uh, has arisen out of the need to conserve our resources and channel it to where it should be used. As a developing country with a lot of challenges, socio-economic, political, and whatever, we need to cut our coat according to our resources. Uh, we have come a long way as a country, and we have been living large. And our leaders don't see themselves as leaders of a developing country. They try to imagine themselves as leaders of a, a Western country or an oil-rich country. And once you have this mentality, you will not be able to cut down to the realities of your country. Now, the outcry over the way public funds have been wasted uh, at this very moment is precipitated by the hardships and suffering which our people are undergoing presently. 
with the removal of subsidy, uh, people have found themselves in one of the most tightest corner in their history. People cannot pay their rents, they can't pay the school fees of their children, they cannot feed, they virtually can't do anything. And there was call by the government for people to make sacrifices. And the same government uh, insisted that these sacrifices will yield result. And if sacrifices have to be made, it has to be done across board. It is not the poor that should suffer the consequences of an economy they never mismanaged. Mm. And they should not be the guinea pigs of any economic experiment. So if the government is serious about cutting the cost of governance, it should be across board. The presidential announcement is unprecedented in the last 24 years since the return of democracy. At least after Omar Musaradwa, with the exception of Omar Musaradwa, who lived a prudent life, who, whose lifestyle was pattern, uh, was one which he does not value or does not glorify wealth. Um, all governments since 1999 have not realized the need for them to do what the president now has announced. So, Hold on. Yeah. Cutting the travel expenses by 60% is a significant step. Local government chairmen, state governors, um, ministers, the president, and public office holders are living very large. There was a time uh, a train crushed uh, one of the NTA staff in Kubwa. That's right. Mm. And we were uh, scheduled to visit the families. A minister was coming after the visit. The vehicles that I personally counted are almost close to 30. Mm. I mean, escorting the minister. You go to other Climate. countries that are better economically and they have addressed the basic needs of their people and they have resources and reserves far ahead of us. You don't see a minister with more than one vehicle. So <clears throat> cutting the travel expenses by 60% is an appreciable step, but it is talkism. It has to go beyond that. It has to go across all areas, sectors, and spheres where the federal government or those in the position of authority are wasting public funds. Okay. You what? talked about tokenism mm. and, uh, you know, part of some of the concerns that have been raised uh, that um, the president's um, commitment should have gone beyond just travel um, or his entourage as the case may be. We have seen in recent times, as I'm sure you would have noticed, the use of the presidential said just about uh, just um, uh, about everyone in, in government. You see them in public functions that have no relevance to governance, and they are there with the, the, the Air Force One. Uh, just every member of the first family now seems to use the Air Force One to all kinds of ceremony. Um, officials of government that should be bought in public transport system or public flights are using the Air Force One, probably for condolence or showing up at weddings and all of that. Do you think that beyond the entourage, this statement should be expanded to several other areas so that we can begin to see sanity. Uh, and perhaps maybe other public officers will begin to take cues. You see, um, since 1999, most government comes into power and everything was done like ad hoc. It's a marathon. You come, you bring policies and programs, and before you attain all the policies, Collapse are collapsed or they are not implemented and these things here. So when we have a new president who has a background of being in the trenches and um, agitating for fundamental reforms in Nigeria, this is the time to do it. <clears throat> if we have to cut the code of governance in Nigeria, we have to do a structural reconfiguration of the country where in every aspect we now adjust ourselves to the realities of ourselves. 
when I say structural configuration of this country, it is what some people say is restructuring. You see, this is a nation of 224 million, million people. Mm. Approximately. Approximately, and democracy is 24 years old. Okay. This is a country with a very lean resource. We are an oil producing country, but we are not a wealthy country like you have Qatar, you have Kuwait, you have Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Looking at the resources in tally or in tandem with the, the population. population we have. Now, if you want to do a fundamental reset of Nigeria, you have to look at all straight. We cannot have a country that has 360 members of House of Reps, 109 Nine senators. That need to be addressed. 36 states that are simply administrative carve-outs have state assemblies and commissioners. A president is constitutionally also enabled to appoint one person per state. state as a minister and then zonal before you know you are having up to 50 ministers. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at this, you will see where our resources are simply going to, to service bureaucracy, to service political structure, uh, to service political power. And we have to tell ourselves, if we look at countries that have advanced, like Indonesia, Malaysia, South Korea, you don't even go to Germany, Netherlands, that are all, <laughs> that are all democracies. If you look at these countries here, yeah, one of the fundamental reforms they took to be where they are is to make sure they cut waste to make resources available for the economic transformation of their country. You go to a certain ministry in Nigeria, you see not less than 1,000 people employed. And this is a job that can be done with 25 people. Then you ask yourself, is that what we want to do? For example, in the investigation that has been going on, mm. especially with the case of CBN, then you ask yourself, if all this gross misconduct and looting must have taken place in the Central Bank of Nigeria, where is the National Assembly? Mm. You are paying 360 people, 109 people, salary, allowances, running costs, and before their very eyes, all these things took, all these things that took place. So, <clears throat> Tinubu has cut his travel expense by 60%, but he has to go further. There is the Oransai report mm -hmm. that has been laid on the table for over a decade yeah. on how to restructure the Nigerian civil service. You ask yourself, why is that report not implemented? I will give you 20 typical agency of government. For example, you'll have a federal agency that has offices in all the 36 states. And then they will say, okay, also, that agency have zonal offices. Mm. One in Kaduna, one in Jos, one in Meduguru. And you go to zonal office and find that they are doing nothing. Mm. Because all the state branches come to Abuja. So, <clears throat> President Tunubu has done a good job. But now it's for Nigerians to monitor. Mm. Because saying it is one, and then implementing is another. Mm. He's cutting the travel expenses, means convoy, means allowances. But who is going to make sure that that is not simply a political talk? So that's why the citizens have to be involved. Mm. So <clears throat> if you are, I am, I am a senator who served for four years. That's right. And I know what happens in the National Assembly. Every year, every reps and senator is entitled to a new vehicle. Every year? Yes, whether you are re-elected or not re-elected, every year. So if there are people that have been in National Assembly for 20 years or 22 years, it means that every four years they have new vehicles. And this is a country where we are being surrounded and being 
challenged by the needs for us to deploy our resources to where it's needed. So, so Tunubu should go beyond that. If we are going to reform Nigeria's economy and achieve our economic goals, sacrifices is necessary. I shouldn't be one side. Mm. It should be general. Because right now, if you cut the travel expenses of your government and the state governors refuse to do it, mm. what it is, during the last Christmas and New Year holiday, all the 36 governors chartered planes and moved to Lagos to go and congratulate to go and greet the president G R E E T the <laughs> president this is a man they see every day when they come to Abuja and you can imagine if you are a governor of a northern state and you have to move with your commissioners and whatever to fly to Lagos go all these air chartering companies are all at the, um, at, at the in Abuja that's right ask them how much it is so 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 the president should not encourage this. Where are we coming from? Mm. We come from an eight-year journey of Buhari, 2015 to 2023. Mm. At least when he came to power, there were a lot of expectations and hope. People were confident and very hopeful the that this is a man who lived relatively a prudent life, mm. And he has made a lot of statements and commitment before he took over power. First of all, he challenged the issue of subsidy, and even to the point that who is subsidizing who. Mm -hmm. He raised the issue of private uh, of presidential jets. Right. But he spent all the eight years, and we simply moved from one portfolio legacy to another. So right now, that's why people will appreciate what Tinubu has done. Because they have not been able to see this, at least for a very long time, even if it's just a mere statement. Okay, right. comrade, let's take it to, um, you know, during the public presentation or consultation, rather, of the 2023 to 2026 MTEF, where uh, the uh, Director General Budget of the Federation was talking about how the government is going to systematically cut down the cost of governance. And he mentioned a lot of things, a raise of things that the government would do. And then months, let's say, he, uh, Several weeks later, we're seeing that the president of the country is coming up with cutting the cost of governance when it comes to people who follow him on international or local travels. Do you think that that is some sort of a diversion of the attention of Nigerians from other things we're expecting the government to do? And what do you think about the time frame for these decisions to be made by the Tinubu administration? Well, you see, why the inventors of democracy invented the National Assembly is for it to perform the role of check and balances. If you have, if you don't have National Assembly, you don't have a parliament, you simply have a strong executive power. You have a king mm. whose, word, whose word is a law. Like when Napoleon Bonaparte said, I'm distinct. So, so without the National Assembly, whoever is holding the position of the executive, either at the state level or he is the, he is the state, because whatever he said becomes a law. Now, <clears throat> when this budget was presented to the National Assembly, at least during our time, it is impossible for us simply to rush to pass budgets without due diligence and scrutiny of every page of what you have presented. Mm. And that's why the Eighth Senate, I'm not boasting or making, denigrating the Ninth or the Tenth National Assembly, but I'm saying everyone knows that during the Saraki tenure, we held the executive to account on every aspect of governance and policies. Now, from the low one, era to this time, there is more emphasis on meeting up the deadline than a qualitative and forensic analysis of the budget by the National Assembly. There is no need for you to rush. The Constitution and the law has given you enough time to work on it. But they simply want to meet the 31st of December 
deadline. And as such, many things are not properly scrutinized. scrutinized. Forget about the state assembly. <clears throat> what happened in state assembly is sad because everything the governor wants, he gets it. The speaker and the principal officers were simply boys of the governor and everything he wants is get if you attempt to raise any issue at the state assembly they they suspend you and they penalize you so you can see the states are simply a jungle in which the national resources and budgets are simply being <laughs> wasted yeah. uh, hold on i'm coming for them now what happened inside the budget is key to the issue of cutting cost of governance. Look at Nigeria's budget and see. Every year, you see ministries, department, agency buying computers. Mm -hmm. Every 12 months, there is no item that takes a lot of money, like computers. And because they have a lot of languages they use there, uh, computers, Wi-Fi, Rome, this and that. So, so they have said so many things there, and the cost is there, and you simply... Uh, love the song. You love the song. And then feeding. From the state government to the federal government. When you see the budgets that are made for feeding presidential palace and governorship houses, then you ask yourself, these are money enough to set up food factories. There is always budget for furniture. There is always budget for transportation. There is so much budget for so many things. It only requires a National Assembly that will go item by item going down. You see, you will see uh, agencies of government, ministry, department agency, or federal government. Some under Ministry of Agri, some under Science and Technology some other transportation. All of them having budget for roads and street lights. Mm. Not very much of works. That's right. Yes. Rural roads, rural street lights, and so many things. So uh, we can't cut the cost of governance if we don't do a diligent work on the on the budget. You know. Because the documents in the budget is so bulky. By the time uh, and it's one of the tricks which I, I come to realize. Mm. When I was at the National Assembly and we summoned a member of uh, a head of ministry department agency and i simply said please i i want to know the 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 the, the cost of furniture in your office which you are putting the board he'll bring you about 300 pages instead of just one page to tell you this is what he wants so, so, so in this aspect you have a bulky budget and you have two to three weeks for people so everything seems like a formality. Mm. They invite you, head of government agency, you come, you talk, you, 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 you clap at each other, and then you leave. And that is why the parliament lost its respect when it doesn't do its job. Yeah. And yeah. this is why we are still suffering this. Right. But it seems the National Assembly has uh, no problem with whatever is happening because this is a recurring decimal. Every time we're budgeting for things that are not relevant at the expense of the ordinary Nigerians. Why is it so? Yeah, it is so because um, I told you, the emphasis is to meet up time. And when you have time to meet up, you don't do... Uh, you, there is enough time for you to do three to four months of work on it. But they simply want to meet 31st of December deadline. So now you have an executive that has a new budget at hand and that also has an outstanding budget. So they are almost at freedom, to, at, uh, at liberty to do whatever they want to do. This is a budget that is supposed to start working from, let's say, April, a new budget. But you are passing since 31st of December. So, so, so the National Assembly is simply not doing its work. So is there a yeah. problem with our budget cycle now in Nigeria? Well, it's not the budget cycle. It's the caliber of people that are in the National Assembly. Help because us. if you cannot, if you cannot question head of MDAs on the kind of money which they inserted. But you see, the, 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 the whole thing also borders on 
this kind of uh, complicity between the National Assembly and head of MDAs when it comes to your budget padding. In some cases, they say budget insertion, and some they say it's budget padding. And budget padding cannot happen without the synergy and collaboration between the National Assembly and head of MDAs. For example, now, if you are going to construct a road for for 10,000 Naira, and then you insert it in the budget, and you come before a lawmaker, the committee, to defend your budget. The committee knows very well that if that figure is inflated, they know. Because many of them are experts. Many of them are contractors. They know. But if they have interest in that project, they will not raise an eyebrow. And these things happen because we don't have a serious civil society presence when it comes to the issue of budget monitoring, budget implementation, and whatever. Many of these NGOs have to be supported by foreign money. They have to be supported by donor organization for them to be able to do their job. Uh, I can tell you, as of constituency projects, you see, every member of National Assembly is allocated a certain amount of money to implement constituency project in your area. This can be buildings like hospitals or schools. Mm. This can be empowerment material, and this can be training. But now, the government says that the ICPC will be the one to monitor this project. And if you look at the number of people at the National Assembly, 360 in the House of Reps, and then 109. Yeah. So does the ICPC have the manpower to go around looking for projects? OK, if you come to me now as an ICPC man, and say you want to monitor my project, I say, you're welcome. Your Bureau of Hospital, I say, yes. I say, why is it? I say, it's a Bindungwari. Can you, an ICPC person, go to Bindungwari and check that? You can. So there are budget NGOs, budget monitoring NGOs, but their own capacity is very limited. So that's why everything simply is about uh, the executive, the legislature having their way because the citizenry are not well involved in monitoring the activities. Okay. Um, the budget is one singular document where we can effectively, if we want to, you know, cut the cost of governance because of the sheer wastages. You, you don't need um, any scientific barometer to, to, to understand these wastages when, when you see them. Um, I was looking at the budget of government enterprises, 62 of them that were captured. In the face of all the things that the president talked about, you see um, government enterprises budgeting over three, five billion for medical expenses. And, and you keep asking yourself, who is getting what for some agencies? You see sitting allowance of bots that have been streamlined by, by a circular of the federal government. You see them budgeting over two, three billion for sitting allowance of board, board members in a commission and a similar commission somewhere else is budgeting just about a hundred million. Is it about the commitment to do the right thing or the unwillingness by members of National Assembly as well as the executive? Because um, at the level of budget aggregation by the Ministry of Planning and Budget, there are basic things, there are basic templates that can be used to cut down on those wages and insist that these government agencies and parastatas do the right thing, even before the government gets to you. Is it a sheer lack of um, willingness or the inability or the incapacity, as you have, have mentioned, uh, for us, uh, for these government agencies to do the right thing? Or we have just given up, as it were, on what we need to do and hoping that uh, things change for the better on their own? <sighs> You see, um, one of the problems we face as a country is how governance is personalized. Uh, when the budget document is brought before the National Assembly, the, what happens is that the president wants to implement his program and policies, and this is the budget. The first thing that happens at the National Assembly is that all members of the ruling party 
without even going through the budget, they have accepted that this is a holistic, a holy budget, a holy document As that should, should, not be, yeah. should not be tempered with. Mm. And you start from that. Any attempt by any person to stand on the way of that budget is being seen to be an enemy of the government or of the president. And that is why you found out that the ruling party that always dominates the seats at National Assembly already have a majority to pass the budget. That's right. But you ask question, where are the opposition members? The PDP, the Labour Party, the NMPP. In this situation, you find them that you don't find, you will not see any difference between an opposition party and members of the ruling party because they concur. With only very few of them, they are able to raise voices. And this shows how the independence and the sanctity of the parliament is being mortgaged to the executive. Willfully. Yes. Uh, you see, why ours was different is the way in which the leaders of the SNA came to office. Uh, the president of the Senate, the speaker also, were not favorite candidates of the president. So they won, and I saw their independence and guarantee. But when people are elected because they are close to the president or because they are favorite of Mr. President, they will always want to do that robust term uh, culture of approving everything. Mm. Nigeria's debt today, uh, by 2023, it, it rose to about 77 trillion. I was the chairman of the Senate committee on foreign and local debt. Mm. When the Buhari government brought before us a request for almost $20 billion loan request, and the Senate president forwarded the request to me. Now, I went through each item in that request to see which one is relevant for us to approve and which one can be sourced here. Must you borrow money from China to do a runway in Abuja? Must you do that? Must you borrow money from China to construct dams if you have investors locally that you can do partnership with? So all the requests were simply frivolous. So when the nine Senate came, they are just approving, 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 approving. Every request they approve. Mm. And then we, we end up with 77 trillion. Mm. And this government inherited this, that, that challenge. So if you have people in National Assembly who are ready to kotow, to be subservient, pliant, and to surrender the independence and the responsibility of the parliament to Nigerians, you will almost have everything being passed. Mm. And you may not blame the ruling party because they always want their president to move on. But you ask question. When people are elected on the platform of opposition, it means those people who elected, they wanted to see something different. They didn't vote for an APC candidate. They voted for a PDP or Labour Party or an MPP candidate. So it means that those people who voted you wanted to see something different from what the people in the ruling party are doing. But you now represent the opposition in the parliament and you do things worse than those in the side of on the side of the ruling party so budgets are being passed with all their weaknesses default and corruption because uh, those who need to it. do yeah those who need to do diligent work simply want to please the president and that is just what happened okay comrade there are procedures for these things to happen uh, I, I know that there's a public procurement act of 2007 and other laws, plethora of laws that actually stipulate how these things take place. Do, is it a problem of implementation or we have much more power conferred on the one arm of the government than the other? What is the problem? Can you help us understand what happens when some of these things are not implemented or some of these acts? Uh, just shoved under the carpet and everything is done to please one set of people. Well, let me, let me show you 
which people may not be able to notice the Nigeria of today. The genuine representative voices and conscience of Nigerians today are the young people you see in social media. They are the ones. Why do you say that, sir? Because these are people who have no political allegiances. They have nothing to lose. They are not contractors. They are not looking for political positions. And as such, every issue, they harp on it. They put pressure. They highlight it until the government is forced to do things like that. Let me show you how things happen. Um, the president has slashed the travel expenses. It's not because the National Assembly or the governor told him to do that. It's because of what you read, the pressure on, on the National Assembly. Now, a, governor, a, a minister is suspended. It's not because the Senate or House of Reps or the governors told them or forced them to read. It is what young people say and do. So you see, we have, we are, we have evolved this society to a point where the citizenry have become the, 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 the fourth or fifth arm of government, mm. monitoring activities, expressing their opinion, Understood. and doing what is right. In the past, it was left for the media. But now, almost you have a citizen media uh, uh, doctrine now. Mm. Almost everyone On is... Uh, yeah, yes, mm. everyone uses a data of one or two nera or five nera to air his own opinion. Uh, let me show you how things happen. During the lower ninth National Assembly, yeah. there were two laws that could have been passed. One on hate speech and one on social media. So indirect. Yes. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <coughs> the executive at that time, they were in support of it. The governors were in support of it. Many of the senators there are, are in support of it. But what stopped it is the popular agitation from young people outside saying no, that this is not what is supposed to be. This is not even what is happening today. The killings that are going on. You will see that if you have a regulatory agency that restricts a broadcasting media from, from, from publishing or airing anything, the pop people on the ground will do it. Sure. Yeah. So you are now to left behind. Yeah. So we are having a situation whereby every citizen is becoming a guardian and avant-garde of democracy, putting those in the position of authority on the dock every day. So they are doing more than those National Assembly. Uh, the take for this is, you see, when you watch what's happening at the National Assembly, you see some people are quiet, they don't mm. talk mm. on some certain matters. It's not that they have no opinion, but they are weighing the implication of what they will say to their own seat, or they are going to hurt someone, or they are going to be targeted. But is that a good thing? Well, this is what I'm saying now. Because they have failed to do that, and because their own views, position, and responsibility and conscience is being restricted by their political interests. Now you have a new citizens, young people, or any Nigerian now, has now taken off the mantle himself. What the gavel can do, the smartphone will be able to do it. All right. Um, comrade, you, you said something at the onset of your intervention that, that, that resonates with me, which was the fact that this president has given himself as a willing reformer and as somebody who listens in, 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 you know, in, in sharp contrast to uh, what we have seen in the last um, eight years where you raise those, you complain, and it just basically feels like mm. those who should do something about it are not interested in those complaints. A number of issues uh, have been thrown up, like you said, by this active citizenry on, on the social media that has seen the president act you know, in certain directions to suggest that he does really listen. But how do we guide this willing reformer uh, in, in such a way that we can extract the maximum benefit uh, from his 
his uh, disposition because uh, these voices are not coordinated um, in a way it, it's just spontaneous uh, and sometimes as your, your colleagues in the National Assembly we say they are quick to even disparage some of the issues that are conversed by this active citizenry. How, what, what kind of unifi unifying uh, factor or, or vehicle you know, should we begin, should we see civil society people begin to put up instruments that will shape this kind of conversation or engender the conversation and, and provide direction? Because oftentimes these conversations come up and somewhere in between our ethnic differences you know, sets in and, and, and sort of take the steam out of the conversation and it becomes you're not liking the face of Comrade Sheh Usadi because he's from one part of the country or he's finding it convenient to, uh, to, to speak on these issues because it borders on um, the infractors are from, uh, from the other side. How do we provide that leadership that is really needed to governance this conversation and get this government to do more of what the people think it should do? Yeah, your, your question can be sieved through the past and present experiences of Nigeria and governors. One past, I mean the last eight years before the coming of this administration. We have come from a journey, a government that has a different mindset than the one we have today, or at least relatively different. Mm. In the last eight years, an inspector general of police will complete his term instead of a new one to be appointed, they will extend it by two years. And then when the two years reaches extending by six months, mm -hmm. when the six months reaches mm -hmm. by, three months. by three months, and then two weeks, and even three days, they did that to immigration, they did that to prison service, service they did chiefs. that to police, they did that to service chiefs, they did that to many heads of agencies. As if the last president don't know anybody in Nigeria, doesn't know anybody, it's only those persons. So this time around, Things are not in along that path. that path. Secondly, you know it very well that where we come, what has happened in the last two, three days in Nigeria couldn't have happened. Where you have a minister that has heard and then people rose up, the last president we had will never take any action on this. Mm. He will look at it and then give you hope that the government is doing something about it and then nothing will be done about it. So, but this one here is listening and he is doing it. So it's not about pressing him, but we are coming from something different from what we are having here today. Now, <clears throat> going to your question, many crimes and many acts of misconduct have been condoled by our society for religious, ethnic, and other sectional reasons. Killings have been happening in northern Nigeria since during the time of Jonathan. But you see, in, there are people from the north who during Jonathan will blame Jonathan for the killings. And then when it comes to Buhari, they will blame the terrorists for the killing. And now it comes to Aswaju. They are saying the pres problem is the president. Mm. You get that. Mm. Simply for the fact that in this country, we are so soft, we are so loving uh, to any person who comes from our own geographical, ethnic, or just area, and that they see that as someone whom they should protect his integrity and identity. Against uh, uh, enemies from the other side. From the other side. Killings have been going on in Kaduna and Plateau. But let me show you a typical example. In Kaduna, there are killings in southern Kaduna. Kidnappings, burning down of houses from where the predominantly Christians are. But also happen in the northern part where the Muslims are. But the difference is that the Christian side will tell the world every act of terror they will publish, Publicize. tell the world, make noise about it, show the world how they are victims. Why do people don't hear from the northern side? Because those who are supposed to speak there 
in the last eight years, see that if they talk, they are simply undermining, uh, denigrating, or damaging the image of the president who come from their own part of the country, and the a governor, and, and a governor who is running a Muslim Muslim ticket. So that's why, when you come to the National Assembly, the most vocal legislators, lawmakers, are the one from Southern Kenya. Mm. It's only when I was there, I would say no. My people have been killed in Benimgari. My people have been killing in Gabi. My people have been killing Giwa local government. And you can't say because the president is a northerner, I should not stand up and demand. These are not mere statements. These are all facts. We leave footprints now. You can Google them and see what happened. But my colleagues from the northern side will never speak. They don't want to be seen talking. They don't want to be. So the world will only know about the killing in Southern Kaduna. They will not know about Benimgwari. They will not know about Yiwa. They will not know about Zaria. They will only know about Southern Kaduna. So that's what happened. Right now, I must say, uh, there is a more serious security presence in, despite the killings, uh, Ribadu uh, intervention in Lagos, uh, Kaduna, Abuja Road and other security agents have been doing a good job. Even last few days, I was the one who broke the news that there was kidnapping. But people. Yeah, yeah, but it was an isolated case. Mm -hmm. For a very long time, people have started developing conflict. So, so what is happening? We can only build upon it. We must keep aside ethnic, uh, religious, and sectional sentiment when dealing with national issues. I expect after the killings in Plateau, for northern leaders, traditional rulers, religious leaders, elected and unelected uh, public officials, and civil society groups, to converge in Kaduna Ojos, to prefer solution to the new government. This is what we want, and this is how it's supposed to be done. But nobody, everybody is only interested in going there to pay condolence. And then after condolence, they move away from Jaws, another attack happens, and then you go again. Mm -hmm. You can't fight terror if you are a divided uh, uh, people. The terrorists killing the people of Southern Kaduna and Plateau are the same terrorists killing Muslims in Zamfara, in Sokoto, in Niger, in Kaduna, in Katsina, in Yobe, in Borno State. Terrorists have no religious preference. They can even kill their members. Mm. But when you have what we have today is such a way that if terrorists attack Southern Kaduna and Plateau, you'll find out that basically those who will be criticizing and condemning the terrorists are Christians. Mm. If terrorists attack Zamfara, Sokoto, Kazuna, Niger, Kaduna, Borno, or whatever. You find that most of those condemning the attacks are Muslim. Mm. So we are only interested when our it's own is attacked. Geographical space. Yeah. Mm. So we we don't look at terrorists as terrorists. We use ethnic or just goggles to now look at them. Profile. Them. And then when you see them from that prism, you know that the interpretation and the images will be blurred. That's true. So this is what we found. Us. All right. Uh, Senator, um, I will not allow you to leave the studio without passing these other questions to you. Um, there are those Nigerians who think that um, uh, leadership, as, as it should be, should not be limited to where you have the opportunity to serve in the assembly or in the executives. Uh, and that in and out of office, once you are an opinion leader, you should, like you have rightly said, uh, continue to intervene in some of this public discourse and provide shape and direction because you have seen certain things that are very close. Mm -hmm. Do you think we are seeing that kind of leadership from people like you who had been in the assembly before and out, not, uh, uh, who are not serving in any government capacity, who are now free, who do not find, who are not burdened by who would find their, their statements palatable or whether or not they please the president. Do you think we are getting leadership from those kind of people who have worked in institutions like yours and know where these problems are and that can help people point at this problem and mount or exert public pressure to, 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 to extract 
policy statement or differences in those? Are they doing enough? And if not, why are they not? Why are they not speaking up despite not being in power? You see, sometimes there was a senator friend of mine who, when we sit down with him, has a very strong opinion on matters, national issues. He was a former senator. But time and time again, I will arrange for him to speak to the public. He said he will not. And I wonder, what are they afraid of? You are not in the National Assembly, and you are still timid in terms of expressing your views. So I, I don't understand. Maybe it's because of the background. I, I'm, not, I'm not a professional politician. We are activists, and then we find ourselves in politics. And we have been in the struggle for democracy in Nigeria, and we have paid our dues. And we have been groomed and drilled in the struggle. And we have no fear of expressing our opinion. But people are reserved in their opinion, especially the northern part of Nigeria. If the killings that happen in Tudumburi had happened in the south, the noise could have been one Much million higher. times more than this. Hmm. If the killings that happen in Plateau and in part of Karuna, it's happened in the south, people could have been out of it. But we have been, our people have developed a culture over the years of keeping quiet on matters simply because the person, if you see them talk, for example, I watch a, a northern group that is castigating President Tinubu for the insecurity in northern Nigeria. Mm. I called the person who organized that press conference. I said, where were you for the eight years of Buhari? They have not spoken. Mm. So you condole killings and kidnappings just because the person there is our brother, is our uncle, we are the same from the Islam ethnic group, also Fulani, and then you now are talking because someone is not from there. And I said, now, <clears throat> if we look at it from that point of view, then we have problem. That's why you will see the statement comes in, coming in from Oanese and the Fede Fere is sharper, mm. more vociferous than the one coming from uh, Arewa Consultative Forum. Forum. Yeah. Yeah. It was even the Northern Ireland that changed the narrative. Mm. If you can't and you will not hold people to account simply because they come from your own part of the country, you will be the one to suffer. And if you criticize government simply because the person in the position of power is not from your own part of the country, then you are not being sincere to yourself. All right. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we're pressed for time. I'm sure there are lots of discussions we'd like to unpack with you this morning, but we appreciate you being on the show this morning. Thank you so much for sharing your insight with us. Thank you for having me. And, uh, of course, our guest has been Senator Shiva Zani, though he prefers to be addressed as comrade, and he's one time... Uh, uh, governorship aspirant of Kaduna State. Uh, I think it will be banned if you combine the comrade <laughs> and the senator <laughs> and the uh, fashion of a Nigerian. Of course, a former <laughs> legislator. He's a playwright, he's an author, and a human rights activist. And he has uh, been unpacking some of the issues concerning cost of governance. And of, of course, we did talk about security. Of course, that's what you get with Senator Shiwasani in the studio.